God, I thank you for this church. I thank you um, for all these brothers who've come out to, um, to just be enriched by um, your word. Um, God, I, I pray for Ivan, who's uh, prepared uh, all of this content for us. God, I pray that it would be a, a um, productive session. Um, I pray that uh, we would all get something out of it and that we would all be able to contribute to it, Lord. Um, I just thank you so much um, for um, your son, who came and died on the cross for us um, to save us from our sins and provide a way for us to be reconciled to you and spend eternity in heaven with you, Lord. Um, just pray for, for this night um, and uh, pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so we're going to start with like a 12-minute video, which is actually a connector between what Matt and Drew has done to where we're going to go with the church thing. So As if we planned it. As, as, <laughs> as if we planned it. Um, just to let you know, this is this is just one map of early Christian history. I'm going to be giving this to you. each one of you. You'll have a copy of this. This kind of gives you the scale of what we're talking about, and it's hard if we don't have a good idea what church is originally supposed to be in in, in scripture compared to what happened here, because this is a mess, <laughs> and it's 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 very interesting mess, but it's a mess nevertheless. So um, with that being said. What I'm going to do is click this, and there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, let's let's look. Once you see this and this, you will know that God really parted the Red Sea. You're not going to believe this, but professors from the University of Arizona have recently confirmed by using radiocarbon dating that the story of Moses splitting the Red Sea might not be far-fetched after all. But if that wasn't enough evidence for you, look what they found at the bottom of the Red Sea. Now, in case you haven't looked in your mind why this is such a massive discovery, let me refresh your memory. God spoke to Moses through the burning bush and he told him to go to Egypt and tell that stubborn Pharaoh to let my people go but Pharaoh would not listen and so God had to send ten curses to get Pharaoh to listen to him eventually Pharaoh did obey the voice of the Lord and he let the people of Israel go, but only for a period of time. The Bible says that Pharaoh again hardened his heart. He changed his mind and said that the police wanted to leave to 250,000 Egyptians with their horse-drawn chariots after the people of Israel who were on foot. You can imagine how scared the Israelites must have been as they found themselves cornered and in front of them was this big body of ocean. God never leaves his people floundering. He told Moses to stretch out his hand over the Red Sea and it would be parted. And that is exactly what happened. Miraculously, gallons and gallons of water began to gather into these big two walls on either side and there was a clear path for the people of Israel to cross safely to the other side. Now, let's just hit the brakes for a minute because I want to show you a 3D simulation of what the seabed, the topography looks like from Nueva Beach in Egypt all the way to Saudi Arabia where we're going to find Mount Sinai in a moment's time. Can you see how it almost looks like there's a land bridge beneath the water? This land bridge, this natural formation was found by just beneath the water, and the evidence which suggests that it's wide enough to fit two million Israelites as they made the journey to the other side. But what they found on this land bridge is going to blow your mind. You see, the Egyptians even had the audacity to follow the Israelites into the parted sea. And the Bible actually records this. It says that their chariot wheels started to get clogged up. Some translations say that their chariot wheels even came off. So it made it very hard for the Egyptians to drive the chariots. But that didn't stop them. They started to catch up to the Israelites. And you can imagine the Israelites, they're terrified now. They think we're going back to Pharaoh. We're going back to this harsh rulership. But God knew exactly what he was doing. He told Moses to raise his hands again over the sea. And Moses obeyed. As soon as Moses did this, the ocean swept all of the Egyptians, so not even one was left standing. So, take up all night, come on. 
And then you tell me, right? Now, if we scanned the seabed of the Red Sea, what would you expect to find? You would expect to find many, many chariot wheels, would you not? Well, take a look at this picture that was found on the land bridge. And you tell me, what does this coral formation look like? It looks just like a chariot wheel. But get this, when scuba divers went down with metal detectors, they found circular patterns that were consistent to the exact shape that you would expect to find on a chariot wheel. Now come on, even if you're the biggest atheist on earth, you've got to admit to me, that's pretty strong evidence. Now, this is crucial. For many, many years, the popular tourist destination from Mount Sinai was in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. That's where everyone went, that's where everyone believed it was. But now, as we look at this evidence that I'm going to show you in this video, and as we listen to what the Saudi Arabians have said for many, many years, they claim that no, Oh, my son, AI, you know, is a country in Saudi Arabia. In fact, I want you to do something. Just listen to this American pilot describe what he was forbidden to do in the 1940s when he was in Saudi Arabia. And we're talking about where the real Mount Sinai is located. I had no idea that someone as far back would have seen the mountain and had been told that the mountain was the holy mountain of Moses. Well, it's a bit of me to fly around it, and it was all flesh. I'm going to bring out a map. Yes. And this map is of the area that you were flying around then. Can you show me the area where that you were flying around? Yeah, they told me it was Mount Sinai, and it was the mountain of Moses. I thank God let me fly around it. That's what I think. I think he let me hear me both well. And did, it, did it touch your heart to have that? Still does. Before we reach the mountain itself, <coughs> let me show you some very convincing evidence that this could well be in the real Sinai. In Elba, in Saudi Arabia, there is an archaeological site called Moses's Well. Islamic sources, which go as far back as 900 AD, claim that this is the well where Moses watered his flocks and met the daughters of Jethro. But what about this? In the Bible, we read about Moses and the Israelites finding this beautiful desert oasis called Elam. At Elam, there was many springs of water and 70 palm trees. So now, cast your eyes onto this collection of palm trees, which is found reasonably close to the supposed Mount Sinai. And what is it the locals for many years have called this area? They also have called it Elam. But here's some more compelling evidence for you. We know that Moses, after writing down God's laws in the Book of the Covenant, set up an altar for burnt sacrifices. Well, here is an ancient altar made of uncut stones, just by the law of When it would look up years earlier, you know what they found? The remains of many animals. We also know but because the Israelites were disobedient, 3,000 people were struck down. And some actually believe that these gravestones right here could be the gravestones of those who worshipped the golden calf. If you look here, you can see what appears to be mortars that are dotted all the way around Mount Sinai. And it's been speculated, could these be the mortars that were used to grind the manna every single day? And just here, inside the archaeological area, we see carvings of the rock of what is quite clearly calf idol worship. But not only has idol worship been recorded, there's also been found ancient Hebrew mortars <coughs> found on the rocks around Sinai. Which again is more possible evidence that the Israelites were here. And this is in fact the real Mount Sinai. But here's what's kind of scary. These menorahs have since been raped either way. I don't know the reason why people are trying to get rid of the evidence. But for me personally, this is what I'm most excited about. Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that the rock of Horeb was so big that it couldn't be moved. And this split rock right here is estimated to be between 40 and 60 feet high. And inside the rock, it's smooth with grooves that clearly show some kind of water erosion, which is kind of strange to find in the middle of the desert.
desert in Saudi Arabia. But most interesting of all, this rock is found at the foot of the Mount Sinai that we're about to look at in a moment's time. But wait a second, Joe. You haven't even told us what the rock of Horeb is yet. <coughs> well, when the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they began to get very thirsty. And so they started to complain to Moses. Moses, you've led us out into this wilderness for us to die of thirst. And Moses took all of this stuff up and he cried out, oh, what do you want me to do with this people? This was the Lord's response. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. So Moses obeyed God and struck the rock, and out of it flowed abundant water, and the people drank and were satisfied. Now, everyone listen to me, because when I saw this for the first time, I could not believe my eyes. You see, thousands of years ago in the wilderness, thousands of years ago when we look at the rock of Horeb, God was demonstrating a picture of the cross. How do I know that? Because the Apostle Paul says that rock was Christ. You see, when Moses, an imperfect human being, struck the rock, it was a picture of when Christ would be struck by imperfect human beings. There on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ was smitten, was beaten, was struck by sinners. So I gather the goodness to sin. So there Christ's body was broken. He had nails through his hands and his feet. He had a crown of thorns smashed into his skull. His beard was plucked out. There the Lord Jesus Christ bled and died so that we could be forgiven. And just like that rock, was split in two and water flowed out of it, abundant water. When the Lord Jesus Christ's body was broken, when he offered himself as a sacrifice, <coughs> also out of his life flows abundant living water. And just like the water of Horeb was free, so this water is free. The waters, the rivers of forgiveness that flow out of Christ's life are totally free. And I'm asking you today, are you thirsty? If you are, come to the Lord Jesus Christ and drink of his water. Because I'll tell you something, Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. The Bible also calls Jesus the cornerstone. And what was the cornerstone? It was the rock that builders built everything around. It was the base, it was the foundation rock. And everything else did on the cornerstone. And I want to ask you, are you building your life on the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you building your life? on other things. I remember when I was a little boy learning about Moses in Sunday school. And I used to read this story and I used to think it sounds a little bit harsh that Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Why was that? Let me tell you why. In Numbers 20, Moses finds himself in a very similar situation. Again, the people are complaining. Again, the people are thirsty. Again, they're saying, we will die unless you give us something to drink, Moses. So again, Moses approaches the Lord and says, what should I do with this people? So God says to Moses, I want you to stand in front of another rock, but this time I want you to speak to the rock. And when you speak, water will flow out of it. So Moses stood in front of the rock, but what did he do? He struck the rock, just like he did at Horeb. Now why was that a serious thing to do? I'll tell you what, a big junet See, the Lord Jesus Christ only needed to be struck once. He only needed to be crucified once. Before there was many sacrifices, before there was many offerings that the people had to do as a way of atoning for their sins. But when Christ died on that cross, it was sufficient. It was a once for all act and never again did Christ have to be pinned to that cross because forgiveness can be found through that one act. What Jesus did was enough. And really, that is why God had to discipline Moses so harshly because he did not want to send out a confusing message to all the myriads of people who would read the Bible years later. And there is one more reason why Moses wasn't allowed into the promised land. You see, Moses represents the law, and the law will not get you into the promised land. The law will not get you into heaven. No, you need a Joshua. What does the word Joshua mean in Hebrew? It means Yeshua. And what does Yeshua mean in Greek? Jesus. You need a savior to lead Jesus to the promised land. 
It is only Christ who can take the people to heaven. And that is why Joshua was the one who led the people into the promised land. And Moses was not allowed to enter. But let's just make something clear right now. Moses will be in heaven. In fact, we know that Moses is with Christ right now. Because on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord Jesus Christ turned up with Moses and Elijah. Okay, <coughs> we've waited long enough. Here is what I believe is the real Mount Sinai. The Bible says, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And that, my friends, is why I believe this is the real Mount Sinai. You can see it's got blackened peaks as if it's been scorched by fire. And even geologists are really perplexed at why it's only black on the outside and on the inside it's completely normal like normal rock. It's, it's been melting. It's been so melting. How incredible is this? You can notice a sort of pulpit where you can imagine that Moses would address the people and use this natural amphitheater. And if you want to know all about the Ten Commandments and what they mean for us today, you need to see this video right now. Once you see this... Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, I wanted to play this... Um, because it has implications for us in our apologetics. And it's, it is proof for us that God is real, God is not dead. God has never left, God's never going to leave. And that we ha we're, we're now beginning to see proof of his existence and what he did. And it's a comfort for us um, to know that when we're reading scripture, <coughs> Right? There's a confirmation there and a validation that there's truth. Uh, I think it's an incredible um, honor to go ahead and, and be in his presence knowing that these are the things he did before us to teach us what's going to happen today. Um, which brings us to this connector um, from just everything else that we, we talked about in apologetics of really what the church is and what, what is really meant to be. Like I mentioned before, this is <laughs> this is for next week and we can talk about various different parts of that, but this is going to be a takeaway for you to look at. Uh, but what what is church? You know, what do you think church is? Uh, so I'll give you the, the Greek word the translated church in the New Testament is ecclesia. The literal translation of ecclesia would be a call out assembly. Not too different than what happened in the Old Testament there. Um, etymologically, um, speaking, the word church means house of the Lord. The modern word church is a direct descendant of Old English, of circa, of circa. Uh, first recorded use of Old English word is from the 13th century, and it could refer to either the body of Christian believers or to a place where they gather. But it goes back to really what is church? Can someone please tell me what do you think church is? Dave, can you tell me what a church is? Um, assembly of brothers that believe that Christ died for our sins. Mm -hmm. Born again believers. Born again believers? What else? What else? It's okay. This is meant to be interactive. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean what do you think church is? I mean, it, we go to it. We go to it uh, you know, at least 50 times a year, we go to a Sunday service, okay? There's a reason why we go, right? Yeah. Ricky, what do you think church is? A uh, place where people get together to praise God. Mm -hmm. okay. Harry? Oh, not Harry. Ron? Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> a place for us to assemble and praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Rod, what do you think? Well, it's obviously a call that assembly, but I, it's important to know that the scripture tells us that you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So a church isn't a building, and I think we reflect on that so often, and we know for, during the first several hundred years they met at homes. So it was the believers coming together, and it is the, it is the, the body of Christ, <coughs> and more so than that, it's literally the bride of Christ. Right. And what we'll get into that. Uh, 
it's funny, you know, is it a building, is it a group, is it faith, is it people, is it worship, uh, is it a coffee bar, Matt, you know, Absolutely. It, it is a coffee bar, yeah, um, it's a fellowship, what's that, it's a fellowship, it is a fellowship, it is, it is a fellowship, we, we go to this place where the church is, is the body of Christ, which is the head, you know, and, but the church has been changing and what we see now as thinking what the church is, is not really a church anymore. It's, it's more of a consumer item. It's more mm -hmm. of a, a something that, um, there was a funny video that I saw, um, a, a satire of a young couple trying to find a church and they had like almost like a real estate agent <laughs> of taking them to different churches and then they were comparing all the different, what do you like? Uh, yeah, what do you like? Yeah, what do you like? And, um, um, and, and it was really, it's a sad commentary about what, where church is right now. Because um, we've kind of lost the, the genesis of what church was meant to be to what the consumer-driven church is all about. And when we did the mega churches and everything. But the church is the body of Christ the head. Um, it, it's formulated like this where Jesus Christ is the overseer. And to Rod's point, the Holy Spirit is our protector within the church itself. You know? um, the Bible is the guideline. So if you're, you're thinking of a sort of a hierarchy or an organizational chart, that's what happened. You know, what drives, what drives all churches is a, a statement of belief. Um, and the doctrine is what we stand for, you know. Uh, there's, there's a pastor and elders usually handling uh, spiritual leadership. Deacons and servants that are handling the physical leaderships. Um, and, and this also expands to various different things, but, you know, group ministries, we were very... We're used to that. And then the area ministries there. Um, nowhere is there anything about, you know, uh, bands or anything like that. Um, but that's usually the, the commonality of there. How we moved away from that, it, it's pretty telling. Okay. Uh, For just as a body is one and many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, Rod, for in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all we made to drink of one spirit, for the body does not consist of one member. <coughs> which, so when we're looking at this, we're looking at a combination of people where the temple in the Old Testament was almost like a brick and mortar with it over there, and it looked like this, where the spirit or our Lord was over the temple. There. And it turned into this. So, where the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. So, we are the church is a combination of believers that come in there. Does that make sense to everybody? Go uh, ahead. Yeah, I've got a good definition from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's wonderful. Amen. Amen. Uh, the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, and when we look at the bride of Christ, we also have to look at what God did in Genesis, when he created man and woman to be together, not having man to be alone. Mm -hmm. Our God is a God of one of relationship. God always wants to have his relationship with his people. So the metaphor of that is to have the bride there of having continued relationship of those, and I'll use the word elect, in that. And we can talk about that later. But the church is the bride of Christ. Here on earth and in glory. And glory, yeah, absolutely. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, and because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I, I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. One flesh. However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So... Digging deeper into this text, we're looking at what God wants from his people there as being one flesh with him. And that's continuing through here, as John was saying, and, and, 
heaven. Okay. The church is a family of house. Excuse, excuse me. Amen. Family. Amen. The church is a family or a household of God. Mm. Um, and said, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For we did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, for we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Very powerful text here of just claiming what it is to be adopted into Christ's kingdom. Um, okay. And the church is the temple of God. <clears throat> or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not of your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So imagine now that we have the Holy Spirit within a church body, not here in the brick and mortar, but a gathering of believers coming together, the Holy Spirit is on top of this and working through us on this there. Within our own selves, within the temple there, we have said. Uh, it's, a, it's a miracle. It's, it's a glorious miracle that this has happened to us. And when we look at it from this perspective, there, there needs to be a certain reverence that happens when you have a body of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, the community, the spiritual community coming together of understanding who our Father is within that. And we've lost that. We've lost that, that piece of reverence, and we need to bring that back. I'm not saying here, but in this in general, with so many other outside influences there. Um, the church is the flock of God. Uh, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, and in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Uh, and the church is the pillar and the support of truth. And this is a major catastrophe right now happening in Christendom, where truth is just what you think it is, and not scriptural truth that's happening there. Um, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instructions in sound doctrine. And this is really important for us in apologetics, also to rebuke those who contradict it. And, and it is really up to us to stand up for what God's word talks about. We don't have to be nasty about it, but we have to be able to defend it. And we have to be able to communicate it in love, but what hold firm to what God is telling us. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the church is the kingdom of God. Which, when you start thinking about that, the kingdom of God, that we're in here on every Sunday, we're going there, it can be overwhelming to think of it that way. We, we kind of can be very flippant about that. Are your students <coughs> supposed to be advancing while you do this, or are we still on this one? Because no. you're hitting your button, I thought, maybe you're, you're moving slides. Oh, wow. Is it going? <coughs> oh, it's not going. We're still offended. Oh. <laughs> You're still offended? No, no fam, the church is still. Yeah, oh. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. That was a test, oh. Mike. You passed. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad someone said something to me about that. Oh, boy. There we go. The church is the kingdom of God. And to, to Drew's point, so. Uh, Okay, we're back on. It says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. He fills all in all. Ephesians 1, 22, 23. So, for some reason. And the church is a community of all true believers of all time. All true believers. True believers. True believers. Okay. And please weigh in on as I'm going through this thing, because, like I said, the goal for today is to get the baseline there, so when we look at church history next week. Well, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd uh, try to qualify what Rudim is saying. I don't know what the context was for that, but you know, the, the Old Testament believers, which who were believers, obviously, in the Lord mm -hmm. for all time, wouldn't be part of the church. So I'm not sure what, is, what is he, he's exactly saying there. I think what he's saying is all true believers in Christ for all time. Um, and since... Um, you know, 
like if you're talking about like Old Testament, like <coughs> Abraham, right. um, he wouldn't be a believer in Christ, right? Well, he qualified, not, not in, to be not, he qualified by saying the church. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously since Pentecost. But he's, defi he's, he's defining the church. church. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Didn't it actually start yeah, in Acts 2? Yeah, believe the Messiah. They didn't believe that the Messiah was going yeah. to come. Right. Yes. So they did believe. Yeah, they had they just weren't there, there yet. Right. Yeah. The church. David Jeremiah says they became Christians on credit. <laughs> <laughs> when did they get the bill? <laughs> Ivan, is he dispensational or is he reformed? We're not going to go there yet because... Okay. because uh, that's a question I want to, towards the end of this, I want to, I want to talk about that. Okay. Um, I think he's a dispensationalist, but, but that being said, it's, it's, a bigger, it's a bigger question towards the end of this. Um, the church is the elect. So the church is the elect. Those are the ones that have been chosen there. Outside of what we do in terms of our mission, having our doors open, show, showing the world our love, Christ's love through there, but it is for the elect. And, um, and that's very, very important to understand it. It's not a mall. It's not <coughs> an open door retail store. It's not any of that. The church was made for people in Christ. That's yeah. for Does that make sense to everybody? Because that's really a hard one for people to swallow. Yeah. Because there's a, there's a, I often hear is the church is a hospital for, for people. You know? And they kind of make these errant, like, just suggestions there. But it, the original premise of this thing. And this has a lot of implications there. Um, one, not too far away from John 3.16. And what does John 3.16 actually mean? So uh, you have to think about who, or, uh, who Jesus died for and what the church is for and what's going on there. And people struggle with this. They, they really, really do uh, to try to get there because of just their... <coughs> Whole paradigm thinking of what church is meant to be. But does that that make sense? To you? Okay. Oh, don't do this. Not again. No, no. no. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so go therefore um, and make disciples. This is this is our mandate of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. And of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold. I am with you to the end of the age. This is it. Not any more complicated than that. That's what the church, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's there. And finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. That's the underpinnings of what our mandate is supposed to be. This is the emotional tie that we have for each other. Uh, and churches struggle with this part, very much so. There. Especially if you're making it into a product. Uh, so what does the church do? And, and, and what runs the church? So can we talk about what does the church do? What, what do we do? You just quoted the mandate. Right. But <coughs> in your mind, what do you think a church does? What do you feel? What do you think a church do? I was thinking uh, something that <clears throat> John MacArthur said, so big, kind of breaking it down. So there's uh, fellowship, mm -hmm. there's uh, worship, and there's studying, and, and, and then the fourth thing is, is evangelism. But what he said was, you know, fellowship, we will fellowship perfectly in heaven. Mm -hmm. we, will, uh, we will know as we are known perfectly in heaven, and we will worship perfectly in heaven. But the one thing we won't do in heaven is evangelize the lost because they won't be there. Mm. Right. So Amen. that is our mandate. Right, 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 right. Anybody else? You I think sure? of 1 Corinthians 4 where it says we're ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So as uh, ministers, we, we bring forth the truth. Mm -hmm. You make that freely open. And then as stewards, <coughs> you run the show and you protect the mysteries, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. so you have to know the, the mysteries and not let it get diluted, like it, you were talking about. And so you have to be a bulwark. You have to stand against the, the tide. Mm, right. Good point. When heresies arose, they were actively opposed. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Many people uh, point to Acts uh, 2, 41 and 42. Yeah. 
which is so that those who had received his word, so the word of God has to be um, paramount, were baptized. Paramount, yeah. And then they were added that day 3,000 souls, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, <clears throat> the breaking of bread, and the prayer. So that's a template of sorts. I was going to say uh, that it's uh, a place for sanctification between our justification and our glorification. Amen. The yes. church Virgin. is guiding us through our sanctification. Right, right. Yeah, and the church. Working out your salvation. Right. Say again? Working out your salvation. Is yeah. Saying, yeah, another way, yeah. And here, and here, in a lot of ways, it's iron against iron. We're, we're sharpening ourselves mm -hmm. as much as we can. <coughs> um, and, and the church should also be doing that, it's lifting us up. The stronger, stronger we are, uh, and the bolder we are in Christ, the better we are to go ahead and carry out his mandate. But sanctification is key. It's the longest period of our lives where we're, we slowly grow there. We can't automatically be there. So the church in itself is a nurturing place for that. So, and, and accountability, too. Yes. Yes, accountability. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so who runs the church? And I had... had in the beginning there, I, I had the, you know, the pastor and everything. But who do you think runs the church? The Holy Spirit. And what, who else? Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So in all those cases, there's a certain level of reverence that's happening there that we need to, need to do. And, uh, and I had a talk not too long ago with a, a friend of mine about this, and, and he... And I don't know if he's a believer or not. He's definitely Catholic. But he said that Catholics do a better job in reverence than what he sees in Christian, <coughs> in the church. And he was talking about the brick and mortar structure when you walk in and, you know, how uh, ornate it is and then that there's all these different things there. And I tried to explain to him, well, that's just... Presbyterians do a pretty good job. <laughs> yeah, Presbyterians. Oh, yeah, yeah. How did he define reverence? But uh, just like you're you're in awe in the in the place that you're there. You're you're in his eyes. It was like you're in awe in the presence of the God. Like you come into a church, you know, but it's very distorted because it was vague. Yeah, yeah. And I th I think there's a real misnomer there on a lot of um, Catholics' part because it, mm -hmm. it's like there's reverence and all when you're in the building. Right. But when you're outside the building, oh, yeah. Yeah, like there's a whole different persona. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It, 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 you know, where is the reverence and awe when you're not in the building? Correct. Right. I'll, I'll make a point on the Catholicism, if I may, on that. Uh, who are they revering? Uh, they'll revere Mary, the saints, <laughs> right. um, the priest. Who knows what they're revering? By the time it gets to Jesus, it's so watered down. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Because they don't have a direct connection. Absolutely. It's like a spiritual stew they're trying to do. Because yeah. they're, they're throwing everything into the, the stew thing. Yeah, go ahead. Ron. I think a good example of this, uh, the answer to this question here is <clears throat> the fact that how reverent Martin Luther was when he became a priest mm -hmm. right. until he realized the truth and the truth set him free. Mm -hmm. And Amen. what the reverent church was doing that, quote unquote, us believers killing us. Right. Mm -hmm. us <coughs> burning us. Mm -hmm. So there's, you can have all the reverence in the world. Was that happen Christ? Yeah. Muslims are very reverential. <laughs> yes, they were. Yeah. And it's not necessarily a bu building either because uh, Jesus is with us wherever two or more are gathered, mm -hmm. as it says in the Bible. So it's not necessarily a building itself. You know? yeah. There's a reason why Cornerstone is, is grown. You know, there, there's a reason why, um, and Jeff is my brother. I would love to say, oh, yeah, it's all Jeff. No. The Holy Spirit is over this ministry, and the truth is coming out, and the people who are coming there are looking for truth, for for truth, and for God, and mm -hmm. for and for a, a fellowship and a community and a family that's outside there, and we're all experiencing some shape, way, and form that being a believer in Christ cuts ties with a lot of things, family, particularly. Even church family that we see there. And people have struggled in their other areas because of that. And that's how they're finding themselves here. So 
to that point, the Holy Spirit is is working through all that. Chad, do you want to say something? No. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> Pastor Elder, they've been around for a while. Um, the deacons, parishioners, they, they, they pretty much help drive what, what is happening there through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, you know, we talk about what is the definition of a pastor within the church because the, the thinking is, it's almost like a, um, I don't want to say it in a bad way, it's almost like a pyramid scheme where you have a pastor and then it kind of everything flows down. But that's not the way church is, you know. Um, I always often say this, that, you know, Jesus Christ ran a flat organization. You know, <laughs> he, he did, you know. Um, but we're appointed to do different assignments and tasks in this world. And it could be a pastor, it could be an elder, it could be a parishioner that makes the different types of impact. Uh, and there's something I'll, I'll talk about right at the end there that personifies that. Um, but, but he is a shepherd. But he is the shepherd, right. And, he is, and, and the thing is, is that when you, look at, when you look at this list over here, all right, these three will be held accountable to what happens with this over here. We will be held higher standard accountable to the Lord and what happens I th there. I think even Ivan, the par parishioners are going to be held accountable for what they do and what they say within the fellowship. True, true. But to... That's why we need to be certain that we know the scripture and that when we speak it to another person, we are speaking the truth as it's intended to be spoken. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, so the definition of a pastor, <coughs> it's a shepherd, you know, English, uh, English language translation of the New Testament usually render the Greek noun, honum, um, as shepherd. And so we are meant to help feed the flock <coughs> of the church there and do that. And that's what Jeff does, that's what other people do. Okay, so a, what a church is not, all right? It's not a country club. It's not a members only. It's not legalistic, not based on works. Um, number four is probably the most damaging thing. It's it managed by a small faction. You see a lot of church breakup because there's a group that runs the church almost with an iron fist, and they, don't, they really don't allow the Holy Spirit really working within the church. Um, we're seeing a lot of this about places emphasis on cultural relevance, which is the whole woke and mm -hmm. all that stuff that's happening there. And then there's a lot of mega churches that really uh, they make worship music the, really the front and center of what's happening within the church itself. We're none of those. We're not meant to be any of those. Although um, I would say that it's important to become a member of a church. Yes. Yes. Well, it's not a members only, meaning it's exclusive to only members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, you know, becoming a member of a church puts you in a position to be accountable to brothers and sisters in that church. Absolutely. Right, as opposed to basically, I kind of equate it to living together before marriage versus <laughs> marriage. <laughs> you can leave anytime you want um, in, the, in the former right. versus the latter. <clears throat> Uh, here we go again. Uh, I broke it. Oh boy. Here we go. So, go, going back to the the awe of going into a church, like uh, St. Andrews, for example, which is uh, a church at RBC. Mm -hmm. I I love going to that place, and it's you know the the sort of ambiance of it all, right? It's um, it's definitely awe inspiring, but again, that's man made earthly ambiance that you're in awe of, not the creator of the universe who um, <coughs> you know, spoke the universe into existence um, yeah. and, and is all powerful and all holy and all just. Right. And that's really what we should be in awe of, not the ambiance of the place that we happen to be worship, mm -hmm. worshiping that creator uh, in. So um, while, while the ambiance is great, I love it. I, I mean, I get caught up in it as well. Um, that really shouldn't be the focus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny. To piggyback on that, um, 
what we have with these mega churches that are so huge, and then they everything is so big that you have a, a large segment of the parishioners that don't do anything. They're not accountable for anything, and uh, which is what, not what church is meant to have happen. They used to use the term you could go to those big churches and get lost in them. Right? Uh, right. Absolutely, and, and that's another. And, and I think that's why, you know, um, you know, we've talked about this at, at our. At our congregation meetings, like our goal is not to become a mega church. Our goal is to plant churches, right? Because once you get to a certain size, you can get lost in a church, mm -hmm. and then you have no real connection, right? right? Um, no connection for accountability, no connection for discipleship, no connection for uh, anything, and and that <coughs> sort of fosters the, you know, doing my Sunday morning routine, just you know, going through the motions kind of stuff, and and it's better to to stay a bit smaller so that you can have uh, those real connections with mm -hmm. brothers and sisters in the, in the body. A good question is, what is the size uh, of an ideal church? Right. Yeah, uh, for, for me, actually, I actually wrote a paper about this, um, which caused a little bit of controversy. Um, <coughs> my, my ceiling for uh, a church, <laughs> uh, uh, this is when I was in school, they were like, what? Uh, my ceiling for a church with <coughs> where you need to break off is anywhere between 300 to 400 in between that. And I gave scriptural references why that's important. Um, one of them being when, uh, when Jesus gathered everybody together um, and the 70 went out, you know. Uh, that, was a, that was a manageable thing <coughs> that, that he had done. And I think in our time and the way we look at church and the way we manage church here, when you start getting over in the 500s, 700s, 1,000 to Matt's point, um, people people end up being pew potatoes, I call them, mm -hmm. and they don't really do anything. And and what, what you don't want to have happen in church is you sit there and all you're being, do, all we do is feed, 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 and it's just going to be milk. There's no meat. We're just going to feed, 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 and that's not exactly what you want to do with church. You know, within church, we want to lift each other up. By the way, as as difficult as it was yesterday, when Louise going home with the Lord, mm. the pulse of that service, everybody in that service felt the pain, and that's what a church is about. Mm -hmm. They felt the pain of a loss together. We cried together. We laugh together, we cry there. That's what happens in a church right. that's there. When one suffers, hey, Ivan, we all suffer. Ivan, yeah. very important. We've been talking about what the church is, and um, <laughs> our brother here just gave us a model for it. He stopped it, and we prayed for people. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is, this is what here we are. Yes. That Amen. is the church. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just, Drew just yeah. demonstrated. I'm, I'm praying with you, and I'm thinking about what happened, and that this is a model of what we are, who we are. Right. Amen. That, yeah, and that's what it is. And so, to, to, to the whole, me you couldn't do this in a mega church. You you couldn't have any of this happening in a mega church. You know, it, it's the the relationship that, that developed under Christ in the intimacy, the emotional, spiritual, and physical intimacy we have together as true believers in Christ mm -hmm. is so important. Mm -hmm. It's I, I can't even I can't even emphasize it enough how important that is as we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. That's exactly the relationship we will have when we meet our Father face to face in heaven. It's that closeness there, that bond that happens there. And we felt it yesterday. Mm -hmm. We felt it. We all felt the pain of it. And we all glory glorified the Lord to take her home, you know, that she isn't suffering anymore. Mm -hmm. And we thank Him for that. And but we also feel the pain of that. Following up on what Rod said, in a mega church, it, we can't when one part of the body suffers, we can't all suffer like we're supposed to. And when one part of the body rejoices, we're all to rejoice. Right, right. That can only happen when, a, when we're flattened out. Right. And I can tell you from my past experience of when I was going through the throes of cancer. Mm. Um, Which, that there were to God that you, you're yeah. going through remission now. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. But there was, there was, a, there was a, mm. a point there where I knew my brothers and my sisters were praying for me. Mm -hmm. I, I knew it. I, I, I just knew it. Amen. And, and, I, and that was a certain level of peace that was in my heart about what was going on with this thing, that no matter what happens, 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be okay. I have my family here that's praying for me, and I have the Lord there. Mm -hmm. So what a wonderful place to be, you know, as scary as it possibly can be. And I'm sure Dave, yeah, we'll finish. We'll just no, finish. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, the one thing with the mega church, our, our son in Atlanta went to a mega church. Mm -hmm. And he, but he was involved in some some life groups that were fantastic, and they really got you know, with men, and they uh, you know, really helped each other and prayed mm -hmm. for each other and stuff. So you can still have that right in some of the mega churches. Yeah, right. so yeah. When you come to on a Sunday morning, maybe you're not going to do that, but you probably are with a group anyway. Right. I mean, I think it's important that we all are involved in smaller groups where you can really care groups. interact yeah, even, more with each other. Even so in the church. Even in this size church. Even in sure. this size, absolutely. Yeah. Let's see if I can. There we go. Okay. Oh my word. So we got there. We got this. We got there. We got here to this. I'm going to go past this because I really want to talk about this part. Should a church be political? And by that you mean? Yeah, no, I'm not, not. Should a church be political? <laughs> How about that. Like, guys, do you think so? Open question. I think where it points out truth and error. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Do you think that church is separate from politics? Do you think it is? Church should inform politics, and that's how the founders mm. set it up. Good point. So, yeah. so someone, um, I forget who, uh, said uh, politics is downstream of culture, mm -hmm. and the church should be involved in right. culture. Right. Uh, and as a, as a result of that, would be involved in politics. <clears throat> um, because at the end of the day, um, politics is much about morality, mm -hmm. and the church is certainly about morality. <laughs> so. Next week, what you're going to hear is a common theme about politics within the church, mm -hmm. in the early church. Mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely insane of uh, what people <laughs> did uh, within, the, within the church uh, for the sake of politics. Uh, but... Uh, Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, from flesh and blood, has not revealed to you but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not, not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Um, it's curious about that. Whatever you loose on earth loose on heaven, um, and basically it was a person bound in sin and wickedness who are loose through the preaching of, or judged, or disciplined, and by the church based on their works. So yes, the church is political. Now, one point of clarification, because there are <clears throat> others out there that are theonomists, yes. um, which is, I think, a, maybe a bridge too far. Um, and then you've got those that are, um, although this is a nebulous term, the whole Christian nationalism uh, idea. And so oh, okay. you, start, you start talking about Christian nationalism, you start talking about theonomy, um, like it's hard to, uh, and that usually goes with um, uh, post, post mill uh, theology as well, because the idea, if you guys remember about things like uh, preterism, is that you know, eventually the world will be one to Christ, and then right. uh, Christ will come back. Um, if you're sort of pre mill in your theology, then obviously the world would go in an opposite direction, and then Christ would come back. So, um, you know, it it de it kind of depends on your theology there. Um, but there are folks that, um, uh, and theonomy just means God's law. Yeah, uh, so God's law. And and thinking, but the, when you when you have people who are theonomists, they're generally thinking that we need sort of a theocracy in the United States, um, which is uh, um, which is different. So, <coughs> by the way, the case can be made, Christian, Christian nationalism is not a new phenomenon. It's happened since the beginning of the church. So um, it's getting more focused now because it's being aligned with white supremacy and racism and all kinds of things like that. But, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's perverted the, the terminology of, of what really it is there, um, in God's in God's context, He said we are not supposed to be part of this world. But 
while we're here, though, and with the mandate, in a sense, there's, we would love to see, you know, whole cities turn to the Lord and, and have that happen. So, um, okay, the world seems, <laughs> the world seems to be offended except for sin, uh, and it's very true, and that's really up against <coughs> what's happening uh, with, with the church now, where everybody seems to be offended except for the fact that blatant sin in front of them. Uh, John MacArthur uh, talks about that the hand of God is being raised off of the uh, United States, mm -hmm. where um, we're really seeing the craziness that, that's happening there of what darkness can possibly do. And it, and it has happened there. And it's evident about what the government's doing, what schools are doing, what other churches are doing. Uh, it is a clear sign that the Lord's hand is, is, is finally